It is an honor to be in this position to stand before you and proclaim some things from God's Word. And I appreciate your interest in being here. Thank you for putting first things first. It means a lot. As I look in the audience, I see a number of people who are here through much difficulty. And that is always encouraging. In fact, some of the most powerful sermons that I I believe that we see and enjoy are those visible sermons. When somebody makes the effort to be here because they believe in the Lord and they believe that His cause is worth supporting and encouraging. That is, in, that is a sermon in and of itself, to see people come in wheelchairs or, or walkers and, and to see that kind of faith put into action, putting first things first, gives us all an example. And we have those with struggling with young babies. And I know sometimes you might not think that there is much you get out of the, ser- uh, out of the service, but you're giving a lot. You're giving a lot to that little child, and you're giving a lot to this congregation. So don't ever think that your labor is not, uh, it labors in vain in the Lord. It's not. It never is. And so let's always continue to do that. In this lesson this evening, I want us to focus on self-examination. 2 Corinthians, as you see, chapter 13, verse 5 says to examine yourselves. Nobody can examine me and do justice but me and God. No one can examine you and do that subject justice but you and God. And I say that because sometimes we focus on the outside and things are going outside of us, but we need to always be conscious of what's going on inside of us. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. And what that means is you can be into something. Some people are into baseball, for example. They can really get into that, and they can get into conversations about it, and they're quick to get into that because that's that's a a top uh, high priority of interesting things to them. Whereas they might not be interested in golf or they might not be interested in fishing, they're interested in baseball. They get into that. And and that's what Paul is asking us to do is to examine whether we are in the faith. He's not asking particularly is the faith in you. If it is, then you're in it. I mean those two things uh, tug at one another making you examine whether or not there is something truly going on that is powerful inside you. And therefore you're into that faith. And it's evident by your own uh, priorities, what's important to you, what motivates you, what pushes you along, what encourages you. Those are the things that, that are power-packed things that come out of a heart that is full of faith. And so you have to examine whether that's happening, whether anything is happening inside of you and you inside the faith of Jesus Christ. James chapter 1 talks about looking in the perfect law of liberty as a mirror. And what you should see is a comparison of you and Jesus Christ. Of course, when you make that comparison, then, then we see that we've got a lot of work to do. When we compare ourselves among ourselves, that's not very wise because we can always come up with somebody that may be not as enthusiastic or may not be as dedicated. And, and then we would say to ourselves, I'm doing better than that. And then we, uh, we do not compare ourselves to the thing that should be pulling us constantly upward and onward. So he says to examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Because if you're in the faith, your, your faith is directed toward the one who authors that faith. And who has the power to help us finish that faith. So I'd like us in, just to, to uh, take time in the exercise of self-examination tonight. Ask ourselves a couple of important questions. Those questions are these two main things here. When you look at yourself, when you look at your own personal faith, 
how would you describe it? Is it a matter of deep conviction with you? That is, that is the most important thing in life to me is my faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's everything. Without that, I have no purpose. I have no direction. I, I'm, my life is actually a waste if I do not have faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one that forgives me of my sins and gives me a purpose and gives me a goal. Gives me a, a rich promises. Gives me so much to empower me. But how deep is that faith? Is it a matter of deep conviction with you? Is it the most important thing that you have in your life? Deep conviction. It's easy for us to drift from time to time. And that happens to all of us. I know it happens to me. And I've talked to many brethren over the years. And they say it happens to them too. Even preachers and elders sometimes go into a spiritual high plateau and we're seem, seeming like we're flying on eagle's wings and things are just going great. And we feel that we, we sense that we're growing, that our, we are maturing, that things are going in the right direction. And it's easy once you're flying high for something to happen and distract you and then you start to waver and then come down off of that spiritual plateau. It's easy to drift. It's easy to think, well, I've, I've, I've grown to this point. Maybe I can relax a little bit. It's easy to drift from heights of conviction. Are you higher in your spiritual climb than you were? Are you at your peak or can you look back and say, well, there was a time when I was much stronger than I am now. That I was more excited about my faith in Jesus Christ than I am now. And maybe you, something has happened and you've been discouraged and, and you do not feel that your faith is on a spiritual high right now. That you are not flying on eagle's wings. Over time... We can start drifting. And if you drift, you can drift with less heart than you had before. You can drift with less faith than you had before. You can drift with less moral conviction than you had before. It can get to the point that the religious activities that we engage in like this becomes just a habit. I think somebody mentioned that this morning in the Lord's Supper. That we should not just do this as a matter of ritual and habit and get into that without really reflecting on what Jesus did and what that was about. Because if you do that, you, are, you lose the power of it. The power is in the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. And those are invigorating things to our faith. But if we make it just a habit and we put no thought into it and we just kind of drift along and do things habitually, we don't grow. And he says, you've, you've actually taken the blood and the body of my son and you've just acted like it was nothing. I suppose it would get our, uh, our, our uh, interest wouldn't it, if someone like a governor were to come up with some big fleet of cars and some of those were civil servicemen or those that were dedicated to his protection and, and then he came in. And wouldn't we be talking about that? The, the governor came and visited here and he had... Uh, these men that were protecting him. And, and did you see those cars that they were driving out of here? Wouldn't we be talking about that? We would. But if that would be something noteworthy, it ought to really be noteworthy to us. And we got to spend some time thinking about Jesus Christ, studying from his word and how powerful that really is. 
Is your faith a matter of real conviction or are you just floating along and it's just a matter of, well, I've been in the habit of it and, I, and sometimes habits are hard to break and therefore I'm just kind of in the drift along mode. Where does your faith stand? Is it a matter of deep principle with you? Deep conviction with you? Or is it just a matter of convenience? Conviction, of course, that just simply means something that is that drives us to take a stand. I mean, you can do something conveniently, but, but conviction means I'm driven to take a stand, even though I realize that that will not be convenient for me. I'm going to take a stand because that's what Jesus did. He took a stand for me. And he took a stand for me all the way to the death. Yes, my religious convictions must be the most important thing in my life as a matter of deep conviction, not a matter of simply convenience. It will be inconvenient. But it's deep enough to help us rise above the inconvenience of what comes at us on a day-to-day basis. You've got to have the deep enough faith that helps you rise above the inconvenient things that will come. It means to take a strong stand because you are persuaded that it is right. 1 Peter 3 verse 15 encourages every Christian to look at this, that you ought to be able to give a reason of the hope that is within you. Because we've got one. We have looked at it and we have come to the conviction that there is good reason to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And because of that, I, can, I, I have learned that I can give a reason for it. Because it is reasonable. It means that I will believe it under pressure, in spite of the pressure. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1 this time. I, I made reference to chapter 3, verse 15. Now I'd like you to look at chapter 1, verse 6. 1 Peter 1, verse 6. He says to these people, and these were people who were brought to conviction. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, and this is the way you look at things, you say, any inconvenience is just temporal anyway. That's the way I look at it. And so you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, and sometimes it needs to be the case. You have been grieved by various trials. Some of those trials can be difficulties that challenge you physically. They can be Difficulties that challenge you morally and spiritually. That is on the faith level. They challenge your faith. And you are grieved by those various trials. But you recognize this statement as he continues the sentence, verse 7. That these are trials... That the genuineness of your faith, that's what we're talking about is a genuine convicted faith. Deep conviction. You want to know if your faith is genuine or not. You want to know if it's deep. Anybody can have shallow faith. The demons believe and tremble. But you want to know about the genuineness of your faith. How genuine is it? What it is, is if it is genuine, it it is more precious than gold that perishes because we're going to leave gold that perishes behind. And though it is tested by fire, that would be the difficulties that come to bear upon your faith. Does your faith sustain you through those difficulties? 
What you want to be found at the end of the trials that go on in this life is a faith that does this, that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, when he comes back, I don't want him to be disappointed in me. Isn't that the kind of faith that you want to have? I want, I don't, I want it to be found to praise him. And I want it to be an honorable faith that honors him. And I want it to be a glorious faith at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I was pulling for you. I knew you could do it if you held on to the right resources of faith. So it has to be deep enough to propel us and to compel us to grow and develop. In chapter 24, you can remember on the opposite of that when Paul was speaking to Felix that it says that, that he says, you, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. You came close, but you didn't get me there. Of course, that wasn't Paul's fault. That was his fault. He did not exercise kind of faith. He was looking for convenience. And he knew that the kind of faith that Paul was talking about was a kind of faith that would be very inconvenient for a, a ruler like him. Look how inconvenient it would be if our president, our governors, were to actually take the Bible and actually claim it as their own personal faith. It would be inconvenient. Put them in all kinds of difficult situations. The pressure would be there. But if he looked at it correctly, he would say the pressure is there, but it's got to be there to tell me what I'm made of. And I don't want a mere convenient faith because the kind of faith that's going to get me to heaven to the position of praise and honor and glory is the kind of faith that is full of conviction that will lift, lift me above the trials and help me through those trials. Conviction is to believe it under pressure, not because it's convenient. But you believe it even under the most severe trials. Convenience, though, is, is suited to my schedule and my ease. And what's uh, advantageous to my personal desires. Paul did not in any way envision that the faith in Jesus Christ was going to demand anything but the kind of faith that would be willing to suffer for he who suffered for us. Is your faith willing to suffer? Now, as you look in this biblical mirror, it's going to reflect back at you what's in your heart. And what's in your heart is what's important to you. What we ought to have in heart and life is also reflected there. And so you can see where you are and where you need to be. We all need to be at a higher level. I, I believe that we could all honestly say, I, I need to be a little higher than I am. And that's why we press. We do not look Back, we press forward to the things that are ahead because we know there are areas of spiritual ground that we can gain if we keep pressing forward. What we ought to be in heart and life is seen in this mirror of God's Word as well. James 1.21 says it's able to save your soul, but you've got to look in this mirror in order to see what God wants you to see. It contrasts people of deep conviction with those who act on the basis of convenience first. Our purpose is to see ourselves in honest self-evaluation. So let's take a look at some of these people of conviction. The first one I would like to call your attention to is Job. Why did I pick Job? Well, because Job is an example of a person who had genuine conviction. It was tested. It was a tested faith. 
Of course, you know the story. I don't have to repeat it to you. But you remember that he was, he was tested and that he lost everything that he has. Satan had said that if you, you built a hedge around him, you just made it easy for him. But I tell you what, if, if you take away what he has, he'll curse you to your face. He doesn't have that kind of con- conviction. God says, okay, you can take anything but his life. So then suddenly whirlwind comes, whips through the the region and kills his children. He lost his children. I don't know of a pain that was deeper, more significant to a parent than the loss of a child. Even when they're older, pains. Parents to, to bury a child. How do you handle that? Well, the only way to handle it is with a deep conviction. It's going to pressure you one way or the other. It's going to bear on you no matter what. But there's only one good way to handle it. And that's the way Job handled it. He says, the Lord gave. Gave me that chance. And the Lord takes away, and he has that right. And blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of that, he did not charge God foolishly. He did not blame God. He lived within a faith full of integrity. How do you handle? What if a flood or an earthquake or a tornado or something of that nature or, or a fire just completely took everything away from you. You lost everything. How would you handle that? Certainly would be a test of your faith. It would certainly test the quality of it. It would also reveal what's either strong or weak about it. Job handled the loss of his possessions by saying, these things are temporary anyway. And the only thing worth having anyway is God. When it all comes down to the end of our life, the only thing that you're really going to wish that you'd had is God. So why shouldn't that be top priority Before we lose those things. And why shouldn't that be the top priority when and if we lose those things? Job also, chapter 2, verse 9, was stricken with health issues. His wife said to him, do you still hold your integrity? Curse God and die. But notice what... His response is, looking in chapter 1, verse 22, first of all, it says, in all this, his loss of possessions, it says, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Chapter 2, verse 10, here's what his faith said back to somebody who says, why don't you just curse God and die? He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Now, he could have looked at it another way. He could have said, that's right. God shouldn't have let this happen. And then curse God. And then that had been the loss of his soul. Wouldn't have helped his children. Wouldn't have helped him. But he could have done that. How do you handle loss of all possessions? He told her what was in his heart. He says, listen, we're not going to talk that way. You speak like one of the foolish women speaks. My conviction is not so wimpy and so small that you could, you could make me turn away from the most valuable thing that is in my heart, and that's my relationship to God. 
If I don't have that, I have nothing anyway. Shall we indeed accept good from God and say, thank you, God? And shall we not accept adversity? That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. And that's the kind of faith we've got to have, brethren. It's the kind of faith that accepts adversity. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now that's the kind of faith I need. This is a man that shows us conviction. How do you handle a spiritually discouraging wife or husband, whichever the case may be in your life, They don't help you. You got to stand on your own two feet because they're not going to help encourage you at all. In fact, if they're going to do anything, they'll discourage you. They'll tell you, just turn your back on God. Or they just make it difficult for you. How do you handle spiritually discouraging wife or husband? Well, you'd handle it like Job did. You speak as one of the foolish women speak. You you need to know better than that. And you need to know that I stand for something better than that. How do you stand when friends, what you thought were your friends, they question you as to your moral and spiritual integrity? They don't believe that you're sincere. They do not believe that you've changed. They, they knew the old you and they're just waiting to see that old you come back to the surface. How do you stand when all of your friends who used to be your friends now look at you and say, what happened to him? What happened to her? It used to be a lot of fun. Now they've taken this religious stuff too seriously. What you should say is what I've heard someone say recently, and that was this. I take it seriously because he took me seriously. Serious enough to die for me. That's how serious he was about me. How can I be anything but serious in regard to him? Well, how do you hold deep conviction through severe discouragement? Well, you've got to know who you believe in. It's like Paul to Timothy says, I I know who I believe in. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And against that day means the day of his death. When they were going to not only put him in prison, but execute him either by sword or hanging or stoning. But they were going to execute him. And he knew that that day of testing was ahead for him. But how did he hold it? Just like Job did. He said, my faith in God is the most important thing to me. And if I don't hold to that, I don't have anything. How do you hold deep conviction through severe discouragement? I'm looking at James again. I want you to notice in James chapter 5, verse 10. He says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. The patience he's talking about is the enduring kind of faith. The faith that holds you up through the trial and the discouragement. You look at those prophets of God who spoke in the name of God and you look at them as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed. We don't say, oh, pitiful, pitiful, Jeremiah. I feel sorry for Jeremiah. I feel sorry for Isaiah. None of us would say that. I feel sorry for the the suffering that he went through, but I don't feel sorry for him now. And he doesn't feel sorry for himself. None of them do. 
You see, take those men of faith. We count them blessed. We, uh, we hold Job up and we say, look at Job. I wish I had that kind of faith because Job is a man who's happy that he did have that kind of faith. You've heard of the perseverance, the ability to hang tough. You've heard of that, haven't you? And you've seen the end. You see how it works out in the end? Like Paul says, everything works out to, get to the good. We, we look at it this way, that there are only temporary things that help us get to the eternal things in better shape. That's the, really, that's the way it's supposed to be. And so when we look at Job, we, we look at the end result of a man who lived his faith with deep, passionate conviction, and he wasn't going to let any kind of temporal trouble break his will to do the right thing. You've seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. We don't even question the mercy and compassion the Lord had for Job. Because Job, the Lord says, I know this is hard, but you can do this. The Lord believed that if Job would keep his faith in God, that God would be supplying the strength he needed. That's why Paul to the Philippians said, I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If your faith is the kind that receives strength from Jesus Christ, it is an empowering faith. It is a conviction that receives power through Jesus Christ. So you hold deep convictions through the discouragement because you know the discouragement is temporary at best. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 would talk about it's just for a moment. But it's working for you and exceeding an eternal weight of glory. And that's what we want to be found at the end. We want to be found with a faith that's full of conviction. And the Lord says, well done, you kept your faith. And you kept your faith supplied and you kept the faith in Jesus Christ supplying you richly through the trials, that's conviction. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel 3. Of course, you know that story from childhood. Nebuchadnezzar said, at the time that you hear the musical instruments, all of this is really going to be Fantastic, because when you hear all the instruments, then we're going to have a, a bowing down to the golden image. And how, that was a huge image. It had the wow factor built into it. I mean, when they showed this great image, and then you had all of the orchestra going and saying, let's bow down to this image, everybody felt Everybody else is. Better get down. Except these three young men. And what's so impressive is that they were young men. But they were young men who exercised faith at a young age. They had conviction. Even though it was not going to put them in a popular role at all. In fact... Popularity was that everybody's doing this. Why aren't you doing that? Everybody's doing it. Everyone else was not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was conviction that raised them above the need for popularity, the need for human approval. They didn't need it. Oh, it would be nice, but I don't need it. Or you think about their conviction when Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to give you another chance here, and if you don't, we're going to throw you into the burning, fiery furnace. 
They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to even talk about this any further. We have no need to even think any further. You see, their convictions was already established deep within. And they had thought about such an ordeal that might happen somewhere. They had thought about that years in advance. So that when the moment arrived, they could bring their faith to the table and they could be more than conquerors. When we think of Paul... And he gives a long list of things that he suffered, but he says it it did not beat me down permanently. I was always able to bear through it. I was carrying about in the body how Jesus suffered for me. I was thinking about what he suffered. And that if he could suffer like that for me, then I can live by faith in him through any kind of adversity. That's what got those early Christians through the persecutions of the first century. Conviction, regardless of hardship, regardless of what happens out in the world, regardless of what friends do, regardless of husband and wife, And whether they're encouraging or discouraging. Regardless of any kind of situation in the body. My faith in Jesus Christ has got to be strong. Because there is the supply that is going to come into my faith. It's through Jesus Christ. What if the Supreme Court of the United States says you're wrong? Where are you going to stand? Well, I'm going to stand where God says. Even if the Supreme Court comes down and bears upon us and says, you are speaking hate. No, I'm not. I'm speaking love. What you're saying is hateful. What God says is love. You see, it doesn't matter what the pressure is and where it comes from, what direction we must face it. People of conviction have a resource that supplies them in the midst of the hardship and the difficulty. And those who do not have a faith full of conviction, they will simply be weeded out. They will disappear and you'll not see them anymore. We need a faith that is there regardless of popularity, regardless of whether people are singing our praise or they're talking evil about us. We have to have conviction that is there regardless of the hardship that we must face. It must be there because it's not in myself and it is not in men, but it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about some people who acted out of convenience on the other hand. Jeroboam's followers, for example, the kingdom was split. The northern tribes, they began to pull away and say, well, we're not going to be able to go to Jerusalem. That's where Rehoboam is. We're going to have to have our own religious places of convenience. So in 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam's follower says, I'm going with him because it's, it's easier. It's easier to go to Bethel or Dan than it is to go all the way down to Jerusalem. We're going to have a religion of convenience. And that's appealing to some people. Make worship convenient. And it has a certain amount of appeal. People are gullible, have always been gullible. It becomes about us and what fits with my convenience or where there's, that's pretty inconvenient. But it's not about the will of God anymore. It's about how I feel about it or how it makes me feel. 
Judas Iscariot, he was all about the money bag. He was all about what's in the money bag and how I can dip into that money bag and get some money for myself. Even at the price of trading Jesus off. You see, his religion could be bought for 30 pieces of silver. When you look at the text, Judas Iscariot, and when he had that money in his hand, somehow he knew those three years he spent watching the miracles of Jesus, listening to the teaching of Jesus, telling about the unseen kingdom of God and how glorious a thing that unseen kingdom would be, and how it wasn't a physical kingdom, but it was much richer and much more important than physical kingdoms of the earth. And Judas heard all of that, and he held the 30 pieces of silver in his hand. And then he thought about Jesus. But this 30 pieces of silver I can use now. But Jesus. Then after he thought about it a while, 30 pieces of silver didn't look all that good anymore. He threw it down in the temple. He had betrayed innocent blood. His religion was a religion that could be bought. We don't want a religion that can be bought. If somebody can buy you off, you can sell your soul, then your religion is not worth having. It needs to be a religion that can't be bought. The Pharisees love the praise of men more than the praise of God. It was important to them that people think highly of them, even if God didn't. Their lips were into praising God, but their heart wasn't there. You got to bring the lips and the heart together. Let the heart match what your lips are saying. They love the praise of men, and Jesus says, You're hypocrites. You play at religion. You're play acting. The praise of men is more important to you than the praise of God. And so we look at these two lists of of examples. In the mirror, we see these examples in the background in ourselves standing here. And we're asking ourselves, where do I stand? Do I stand in the same position as Job, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Paul? And then you look at that and you consider it. Hebrews 11 and 12 gives a long list of people who did things by faith. And he calls them a great cloud of witnesses are looking on. And they're looking to see what you're going to do with it. Well... We're either standing there or we're standing on the other column where Jeroboam's followers said, make it easy for us. Let it pay some earthly dividends to us. At least get the praise of men out of it. But you know where that winds up. That's really the hall of shame. Here are the, here's the hall of fame. This is the hall that we want to be in, the great cloud of witnesses. I messed that up, but we'll go ahead with that. We, messed, we, we have a chance to stand in either one of those columns. Thank you. The hall of shame, where we had a religion that was built on convenience, or one that was dead set on standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope we choose the good part. That's what I'm after for myself, and I'm after it for you. I hope that every one of us will be in the hall of fame. 
That is, in that hall where God says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the one you want to be in. The other one will hear, depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Because that's who we served. You don't want to be in that group. You want to be in the other one. And I hope I hope that we're all wise enough to take this to heart. I mean, it does no good for me to, to talk about it and bring it to our attention if we just dismiss it. We've got to take it to heart and use it. Where do you stand? And if you need to stand with God tonight, please let your